Hey guys, this is Brayden from The Caddy Cumin. Welcome back to uh, my channel after a short break. We had midterms and uh, long story short, that Greek midterm was an absolute doozy. I'm happy to have that over with. And uh, you know, I've been preparing a few things for this channel and as well as some some other things as well uh, going on in my life. And I'm, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be recording again. Uh, this video is from a presentation that I gave to Oklahoma Baptist students. It's about an hour long over the Catholic faith, you know, just giving some statistics, history, and, and a brief summary of beliefs. I, I, I'm sure I missed a whole lot of stuff, um, but I just wanted to, to you know, really uh, talk about the, the important things about the Catholic faith and, and try to relate them to someone who shares my background as a Baptist or shares my background going to a Baptist university, being educated in that uh, sort of environment. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Like I said, I've been working on a few other things for this channel, one of them being uh, a response to Dr. Gavin Ortland's critique of my video on the debate, the Soul Scripture debate, and that's not gonna be uploaded on my channel. That's actually gonna be uploaded on Swan Sona's channel. So I'm gonna be going on his uh, channel, recording that with him, and that should be uploaded in here in a little bit. Um, we had to postpone the recording, but we're gonna get that solidified here pretty soon. It should be uploaded very soon, and I'm excited to be able to interact with some of Dr. Gavin Ortland's points, and overall, I'm just excited to be back. Anyways, if you have any questions or comments about the video, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. I love seeing your comments. I love interacting with you guys. Uh, leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you haven't already. Share this with a friend if uh, you're interested or they would be interested in something uh, like this, and uh, without further ado, let's get into the video. Um, but today I'm going to talk about Catholicism, which is the fullness of truth. Oh man, they don't have my cool font on there. That sucks. I had such a cool like medieval font. Uh, I hope this can just give a better understanding of Catholicism, help the dialogue uh, move along. Uh, it'll cover statistics, history, and primary beliefs. And I'll try to, in those beliefs, distinguish like, okay, this is where Catholicism and Baptist theology differs because I, I assume most of us have like a Baptist background. And then I'll talk about Catholic distinctives, which distinguishes them from Protestantism as a whole uh, and Orthodoxy. So, I mean, this is a pretty small group. If you have any questions, just raise your hand or just interrupt me. I don't really care. Uh, so, good stuff. So. So what is Catholic mean? Oh, the Bible. So the Bible. So the word Catholic, pretty important to understanding what Catholicism is. Uh, the word Catholic comes from a combination of two Greek words, kata and halos, uh, which mean according to the whole. The first usage of this in history is St. Ignatius in 110 AD. So very, very early on, the church was being referred to with the title Catholic. Um, it's, it's something that you see in the Nicene Creed, too, that we'll, we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, but St. Ignatius was a disciple of the Apostle John, uh, appointed to the Episcopate of Antioch in the first century by the direction of St. Peter. So he, he knew the Apostles, he was associated with them, uh, and he was also an associate of St. Polycarp, if you know who St. Polycarp is. So uh, he says that, um, See that you all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father, and the presbytery as if it were the Apostles, and re reverence the deacons as the command of God. Let no one do any of the, the things as, or, uh, appertaining to the faith uh, without the bishop. Uh, let that be considered a valid Eucharist, which is celebrated by the bishop or by one whom he appoints. Wherever the bishop appears, let the congregation be present, just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Uh, and then he, he talks about how the bishop is practically essential for there being considered a church in your local area. area. Um, and so the, the Catholic Church is the church according to the whole. Uh, according to the whole, I mean, the, that's the etymology of the word. Um, or the universal church. So the term Catholic was meant to distinguish the true church of Christ uh, in the early centuries, uh, which was established uh, by Christ and distinguish that church from the heretical sects. Um, it's a visible attribute meant to convey the fact that the, the church Christ established is spread, spread throughout the whole world and uh, maintains the whole faith. Hey, yeah, the whole faith, hence the title of the presentation, Catholicism, the fullness of the faith. So Catholic is, it's applied to multiple different um, aspects of Catholicism. That being spread throughout the whole world, fullness of truth, um, 
And yeah, so any questions before we move on to uh, the next portion of presentation? No, good, good stuff. All right, so statistics, I figured this would probably be good uh, to go over. Uh, how many members does, does Catholicism have worldwide? Uh, what's the presence of Catholicism in the U.S. and in Oklahoma? I really don't want to spend that much time on this because, like, beliefs are what we really want to get to. But it's the largest Christian religion in the world. Uh, there are anywhere between 1.1 billion to 1.3 billion Catholics worldwide. Uh, most of these graphics are taken from a 2011 uh Pew research study on global religions, uh, but there's new data coming out like from 2019 studies uh, that adjust the total number of people, but the percentages are really what matter uh, because those are pretty st static, they're consistent uh, between the, the, over the last decade, it's pretty static. Uh, so it is, you know, Catholicism is about 16% of the world's population uh, and the percentages with regard to world population, again, is, it's, it's remained the same. Um, and then compared to other Christian groups, such as Protestantism, obviously, it's 50.1% of the entire Christian population. 36.7% um, uh, of the Christian population is Protestant, and 70%, I, I found this out just recently, 70% of Protestants are charismatic or Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So I knew it was a large percent. I didn't know it was 70%. And then 11.9% of Christians are Orthodox. And then 1.3, those are like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. So they're not Christians because they deny the Trinity. Anyways, uh, so that shouldn't even be in there. So anyways, it's probably a little bit more than 50.1%. U.S. numbers, uh, despite being the largest Christian denomination, uh, Christian religion in the world, uh, Catholicism is a minority in the United States, especially in Oklahoma. Uh, so we see in the United States, uh, it's 21% Catholic and 40% Protestant. So there's a huge disparity there. Oklahoma, 47% uh, of Christians are Evangelical Protestant, 18% mainline, so Lutheran, Presbyterian, Anglican. 8% um, of Christians in Oklahoma specifically are Catholic. So needless to say, it's a big religion, but in the United States, it's uh, it's, not as well represented, obviously, uh, Puritans and stuff like that. The, um, the migration to the, to the United States uh, probably has to do with some of that. So history, we're going to talk about the founding of the Catholic Church, uh, the councils and the continuity from the early, uh, the early centuries to now. So it is the oldest living institution in the world. Um, it's attested to in historical and archaeological records, and one of the chief ways to uh, demonstrate this is by apostolic succession. Um, apostolic succession is the idea that bishops can trace their ordination through all these other bishops going all the way back to the apostles themselves, uh, and likewise, priests and deacons trace their ordination back to the apostles as well because they're ordained by the bishops. Uh, apostolic succession was the practice of the early church. Uh, it's attested to in the first epistle of Clement. It's also attested to in the Didache, which is written during the first century while the apostles are still alive. Um, but it's intended to validate ordination of, of clergymen and uh, the preservation and passing down of the deposit of faith. Yeah. So in general, how long are these chains? Chains of ordination? Yeah. Um, I, I'll have to get a list of them. But early on, you see like Saint Irenaeus uh, tracing the ordination specifically of the Bishop of Rome because it's the um, the principal source of unity and stuff like that. So it has preeminent authority. Um, so you see early succession lists, and then you also see su succession lists uh, from those going all the way down. So I'm sure there's a source that I could have included in here that talks about uh, those succession lists and like actually having the list. Um, but one of the most important uh, succession lists is the Bishop of Rome, because um, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope's successor of Peter, and that is one of the ways that um, th throughout history, uh, the church has um, traced succession from St. Peter. Um, okay, but so, like like any given bishop today wouldn't know um, their succession lineage, I guess, all the way back to the they, they would, they would, yeah, oh, they would. But the most preserved list of succession, because it was considered the most important is St. Peter's, uh, okay. the Bishop of Rome. Um, so even in the liturgy, we talk about the early succession, successors to the Bishop of Rome, uh, Clement, Linus, those, those, all those people. We don't list, obviously, the entire one, but there's definitely lists online. Um, 
that you can you can point to. Um, so, and obviously, like these lists are disputed by Protestants. I mean, typically, it, but um, classical Protestants didn't dispute apostolic apostolic succession or the lists of apostolic succession. They disputed the um, the the essential nature of apostolic succession. So they saw that even even if there was a break um, between ordination of, of people, you know, bishop didn't ordain your minister, but your minister has ordained other people. Um, what matters to classical Protestants is that the succession of teaching is there. So they would say if your teaching is uh, consistent with the New Testament, then you have apostolic succession per se because you you succeed the the apostles' teaching and carry them on. Um, but apostolic succession especially in the early church, was meant to root out heresy because you could point to um, the foundation of a heretical um, teaching in one person. So because the faith was spread throughout the entire known world, spread to the, to the apostles, and is preserved through the succession of presbyters, um, if a heresy arises, or if, if even just a new belief arises, um, and it doesn't match up with... Um, what the other people received throughout the entire world, then that would be eventually rooted out in an ecumenical or synod council. Um, so, for example, Arianism is traced back to Arius and Sibelianism, Sibelius, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, but that, the, the purpose of apostolic succession is to provide valid ordination and preserve the faith. So, any more questions before moving on? Uh, okay. Uh, so the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ in 33 AD, disputed by Protestants. That's all right. As a visible community uh, built upon the apostles who together make the foundation. That's Ephesians 2. Uh, and Peter singled out as a unique part of that foundation uh, that Christ established his church upon, uh, calling him the rock. So Matthew 16, 18, uh, it's a very important um, foundational text uh, for the doctrine of the papacy and the, the leadership of, of Peter. Uh, so Jesus says to the apostles, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answering for the apostles says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So Peter, because of his confession that was revealed to him by God the Father, was made the leader and source of unity among the apostles. To him was uniquely entrusted the keys to the kingdom of heaven, so that he and those acting in unity with him, but him specifically, uh, would have the universal teaching authority to bind and loose. And that is the language of uh, first century rabbinic um, teaching, being able to bind the people to a particular interpretation of divine revelation. Uh, and, and Jesus affirms this teaching office, the binding and loosing capabilities, and gives it to Peter in connection with the keys. Um, so that's why, following the example of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, the church has historically been able to call together ecumenical councils, uh, and then local synods as well, to bind the faithful to a particular interpretation of God's word. So the, the binding and loosing is something that's exercised by, exercised by all the bishops, but when the church gives like a full um, ruling on the faith, so as to rule out uh, heresy and to prevent it from being taught throughout the entire world, um, they, they come together for an ecumenical council, and they definitively and finally, like irreversibly, define what is orthodoxy and what is heresy and the condemn heresy. And that leads me into ecumenical councils. Any questions before going on? No? Okay, good stuff. So ecumenical councils. What's an ecumenical council? It's pretty important for um, high church tradition, especially Catholicism, orthodoxy. Uh, it's, it's a gathering of the bishops from throughout, throughout the entire world to settle disputes which have arisen in the Christian world about faith or practice. Okay, so just a side note, you can't gather for an ecumenical council and define things that don't relate to the faith or to morality. 
Okay, because because the function of the teaching office of the church is to explain what has been revealed by God for our salvation uh, and for our uh, Christian living. So you can't go to an ecumenical council and say uh, bananas are the best food. Like that's not how infallibility works. That's not how the teaching office of the magisterium works. Um, and you know, even Pope Francis can't go right now ex cathedra and define something that doesn't relate to to the faith. The magisterium is subservient to the Word of God. Uh, it, it, it's not over the Word of God. It serves the Word of God and explains the Word of God. That's it's it's the it's it serves the people of God uh, to help them understand what the faith means. Um, so it's. Uh, gathering of bishops throughout the world. It's ratified by the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so oftentimes whenever uh, things are, councils are considered to be ecumenical, it's because the Pope either convened it or because the Pope sent a legate to, to oversee it and to ratify it later on. Um, and that's, that's why certain ecumenical councils would be considered ecumenical um, in contrast to other councils that had a lot of bishops at it. Um, but didn't get the confirmation of, of the Church of Rome, of the Bishop of Rome. Um, so, yeah, th there's like the Council of Ephesus II or something like that. I can't remember if that was the um, Ecumenical Council or a different council. Uh, but there's a council that was held at Ephesus that had like 200-something bishops, but it didn't receive the confirmation of the Church of Rome. So neither the Catholic Church nor the Orthodox Church sees it as ecumenical, even though it had all these bishops in it. Um, and no Protestant has ever considered that an ecumenical council as well. Um, so there's been 21 ecumenical councils throughout church history. Uh, the first seven ecumenical councils are generally seen um, as, as acceptable by most Christians. Uh, they're held in common with the Eastern Orthodox churches. I know a lot of confessional Lutherans that accept the first seven ecumenical councils. Some people um, reject the seventh one because it talks about icon veneration. Um, and, you know, classical Protestants, like Lutherans and Anglicans, have at least um, accepted the first four ecumenical councils. Um, and not until recently that the uh, no creed but Christ, no, no council but Christ, just me and my Bible only sort of theology creeps into Protestantism. Uh, do you see people rejecting uh, the authority of the councils as uh, authentic interpretations of God's word? Um, so... Yeah, so continuity uh, through the ages of the church. Uh, the Catholic Church has been in operation from the beginning. Um, again, talks, uh, the, the apostolic succession is one of the chief um, uh, evidences of that uh, in, in keeping with the promises of Christ. Uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail over the church. So Christ is the, the divine builder of the church. It's his body, it's his community, but he founds it on Peter, who is the source of unity. And he says that, the gates of hell will not prevail against them. Uh, so we see this, um, we, we see in this promise the indefectibility of the church. Basically, the, the church will never bind the entire faithful to believe something that's dangerous to their souls. Uh, they'll never offer a definitive and irreversible teaching that is, that is wrong. Uh, that's the gift of infallibility that God gives to the church. Uh, the entire church won't just fall away and just forget something. Um, it's, it's, Empowered by the Holy Spirit to preserve the church, uh, to pr preserve the church in the truth, preserve the truth in the church. Um, so, and again, Christ promises to be with the church until the end of the age, Matthew twenty-eight. And the Holy Spirit is given to the church specifically to guide her into all truth and to remind her of the teachings of Christ. Um, that is th some of the first promises uh, regarding the Holy Spirit is to preserve the church in truth. Um, so we see in, in these passages. The gift of indefectibility, the church will not fall away, the church won't forget something, won't corrupt something irreversibly, uh, and, and things of that nature. So the church of every age, uh, ever since the beginning, has been the Catholic church and the Catholic view. Um, the, this is demonstrated by the inquiry of the theology of the early church fathers, uh, the continuity with the church of every age through apostolic succession, and the teachings of the New Testament. And I hope to demonstrate this, obviously, um, in this presentation. Uh, I won't have like, an exhaustive list of the New Testament or uh, the Church Fathers because we only have an hour, but there's been plenty of, uh, plenty of research done on that. Um, and I hope that, you know, pointing to St. Ignatius about a three-tier hierarchy, pointing to uh, these early Church Fathers who taught regenerative baptism, who taught 
the, the necessity of being united to the Bishop of Rome uh, illustrates the fact that at least um, there is some historical credit, uh, credence to the Catholic faith um, and that our, our claim isn't just out of thin air that uh, it, it is the church of, of antiquity. Yeah. So just to be clear in these verses, um, the church is being interpreted as an institution, correct? Yeah, so uh, G- Jesus institutes a people that is, that is visible. Um, Christ compares the, the church to a city on a hill uh, to be visible, not to be hidden from, from and, and the light of the world uh, that people may uh, observe the church, observe the works of the church, and um, glorify God. So it's, it's constantly in the New Testament uh, talked about as a visible uh, community. And obviously, it has invisible attributes as well, but it's, it's chiefly a, a visible community and a sign to the world um, uh, to, to help spread the gospel and things of that nature. And um, it's, you know, the church is seen as, as the kingdom of God, uh, and the, the, Israel was the kingdom of God under the old covenant. It wasn't, um, uh, it, it didn't have the fullness of revelation, it didn't have these, the Holy Spirit, the promises of Christ. So now that uh, we're in the New Covenant, now that we're promised the Holy Spirit to guide us in the truth, uh, we have these particular attributes and promises uh, that Christ himself sustains by his grace. So it's not, you know, if this was a merely human institution, it's, uh, every Catholic will tell you it would have failed. Uh, it should have failed, at least. Um, so. Well, I was just curious because a yeah. um, uh, major response or objection I can imagine is that the Protestant will say the church is the body of believers. Right. And I'm guessing Catholics don't think all Protestants are damned. Right, right. So the the church is both a visible institution, um, but also it has invisible attributes. So technically, everyone enters into the church by virtue of their baptism. Okay? Baptism is the way that God makes you a new creature. He gives you uh, his new birth, and he, he engrafts you into this family. Okay, um, so Protestants, though not visibly united with the church, uh, are, are in, in a certain way uh, united, uh, though partially, to the church. Um, so it's not the Catholic position that no Protestants can be saved ever, you know, uh, especially uh, considering the doctrines of uh, invincible ignorance. Uh, you can't uh, be condemned for something that you didn't know. Um, so if through no fault of your own, you didn't know the Catholic Church was the church instituted by Christ, uh, then you wouldn't be condemned for that fact. But if you, obviously, if you knew that the church was established by Christ uh, and still refused to enter it, then that would be a dis- disobedience to Christ. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance when it comes to our, our Protestants united to the church, yes, but not fully, uh, by virtue of their baptism, they're made a new creature, they're made a Christian. Uh, and that's why Catholics would not uh, accept uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or people who deny the Trinity, like one of those Pentecostals, into um, the the terminology of Christian or a part of the church because their baptisms aren't Trinitarian. They're not valid. Um, so, yeah. So, I think, did I, did I answer your question? Or I think so, yeah. Okay, good stuff. But yeah, the Protestants have, the classical Protestantism typically sees the church as almost entirely invisible, that manifests itself in local congregations uh, throughout the world to where you know, the, the authenticity of a church, a local congregation, is dependent upon uh, there being true believers or them truly teaching uh, the, the teachings of scripture, the gospel, and stuff like that, uh, right, where the sacraments are rightly administered and things to that nature. Uh, but yeah, the Catholic Church sees it as a visible institution um, with invisible attributes. Like, uh, it's it's been uh, described in the early centuries of the church as body and soul, so the body is visible. And uh, though you look at uh, the city of God by the Saint Augustine, it talks about uh, how there are sinners in the uh, in the in the family of God uh, that we see, and pulling upon Jesus's parable of the wheat and the, and the chaff, uh, or the, the wheat and the weeds. Um, the, the kingdom of God is like a field with, with wheat and weeds, and the wheat are the sons of righteousness, and the weeds are the sons of disobedience. And it will only be at the end of time that the, the weeds will be weeded out because you can tell them apart from the wheat, um, and they'll be cast into the fire. So even though there's righteous and unrighteous in the visible church, uh, at the end of time, uh, Christ will 
execute execute judgment on those who are unfaithful in the church. So and so on that first verse, it's yeah. being interpreted as saying the church is in some respects infallible. In some respects, and in you know some contexts, I don't want to overemphasize there. Right. Do you think that interpretation depends on the church? Um, in this verse, referring to the visible church. Yeah. So I think that. First, I wouldn't say like this first verse here is uh, a proof of infallibility, right. and I wouldn't try and draw that out from this verse alone. Um, I draw infallibility out of the promise of indefectibility. So if Christ promises indefectibility, i.e. the church um, won't fall away, the, the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, we won't just forget the faith, we won't um, bind people universally to believe something that's heresy, um, therefore Christ will in some way protect the church from doing those things, from falling away from the faith, from teaching things that are uh, irreversibly wrong. Um, so the, the gift of infallibility is is a it's an implication of what's taught in these verses, and obviously there's attestation in the early church fathers about ecumenical councils being infallible, and um, whenever something is irreversibly said or universally taught, it is seen to be protected by God's spirit. Um, so that, that would be the line of argumentation. Um, and again, I could list a bunch more verses, but this is more so about the infectability of the church. So with that, if God protects the righteous, then wouldn't, like, humor me in this idea. No, you're good, you're good. With the Protestant Reformation, wouldn't that be a form of God protecting the righteous by enlightening those, hey, this is not the correct way? Mm -hmm. And so emboldening them to go against the traditional beliefs and standing against that, saying, all right, well, this isn't right. right. It's just the claims that they made. Right. Uh, saying that this was not the way that the original church did it, so let's get back to that. Right. Wouldn't that be the same thing of protecting them from being bound to something that is not correct? Uh, so reform happens within the church, uh, and the, the Protestant Reformation is an example of schism, um, at least in the Catholic view. So whenever reforms happen, especially in the ecumenical councils, uh, there are people whose, whose ideas are, are condemned um, be, because they dissented from the truth, but God acts through his church. Um, God acts in the visible community that he has um, established for, for the world. Um, so would, Pro would the Protestant Reformation be an example of God protecting the church from binding people there? I don't think so because um, first and foremost, Protestantism, a lot of aspects of Protestantism. Um, let's just take transubstantiation, for example. Uh, Protestants reject transubstantiation. That is a dogma of the faith that had been established for hundreds of years prior to Fourth Lateran Council. Um, and so to say that uh, Protestantism is, is the, um, it preserves the truth from a church that had gone astray is to say that uh, the church had been astray for hundreds of years, and I think that would um, contradict the doctrine of indefectibility. Um, but I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that it's implausible that God would choose after 1,500 years to uh, move the church into a time of disunity uh, when one of the essential characteristics of the church is unity and oneness. So there's one church, one body, one baptism, one faith. Um, so that's why I would reject the idea that Protestantism would uh, be God working through his people because reform happens in the church and the church is one. And I think that one of the fruits of Protestantism, um, no offense, is schism. Um, we see, you know, especially in, yeah, I, actually I'm not going to go there anymore. <laughs> so, did I answer that question maybe? So maybe. by contrast, you would see Trent and Vatican II as actual reform? Yeah, so that is the Reformation that, that occurred during uh, the High Middle Ages. Um, the, the Ecumenical Council of Trent, it uh, defined certain things that, you know, it, it dealt with the controversies that Protestants were, um, were battling against, that it also, um, it, it condemned some of the overcorrections of Protestantism in, in the Catholic view. Uh, one of those would be the rejection, rejection of the seven uh, deuterocanonical books uh, called the Apocrypha by Protestants. Um, and you know, transubstantiation is reaffirmed, and um, many other things are reaffirmed. But also, the, a lot of people don't know this, that the Catholic Church reformed the, um, 
the, and I talked to you about this a little while ago, uh, reformed indulgences. Mm -hmm. So there was this, um, there was this view of indulgences that arose among the laity who weren't properly catechized about indulgences, that indulgences were practically a, a ticket to heaven. You could just buy one and go to heaven. Uh, first and foremost, you can't buy indulgences. You could never buy indulgences. That's the sin of simony. And whenever and simony is the exchange of spiritual goods for m material gain. Um, so whenever you quote unquote sell something that like a relic or like a, an indulgence, it, it, because they can't actually be, be sold and it's exchanged for monetary value, uh, it loses its blessing. So uh, simony was was condemned far far before the um, the indulgences like the abuse of indulgences arose. Um, and it reformed that, and actually reformed also, you used to be able to obtain an indulgence through donation, um, which is, it's, I, I can see how people can, can look at that and say, oh, that's just a monetary transaction for spiritual benefits, that's simony. And I think in a lot of circumstances, uh, it, was, it was presented as something that you could buy. Um, but it, it's, it's different because they didn't require a specific monetary amount. Uh, it's, it's you make a donation, it's an act of charity, it's an act of love uh, to either repair St. Peter's Basilica or, or fund all these different uh, charity organizations and they would grant you an indulgence. And also indulgences do not forgive your sins. Like you can't purchase forgiveness of sins. That's not, um, an indulgence isn't even a forgiveness of sins in the first place. It is the uh, it deals with the temporal punishments, the temporal disciplines that are due to your sins. So in Catholic theology, sin has both an eternal and temporal consequence. The eternal consequence is it separates you from God. Okay? All Christians affirm that. When you're forgiven, the, the eternal consequences of sin are completely eradicated. You're forgiven. You're restored to right communion with God. But then there's temporal consequences. Sin has destructive effects. Sin, sin destroys the charity in your soul. It harms your soul. Uh, it, ha it harms your relationship with God. Uh, it harms your relationship with people. And it harms uh, the, the charity that's in your soul so that it makes it more difficult for you to perform good works. So indulgences were meant to aid in your, if, if I use a, a Protestant term, it's to aid your sanctification. It's, it's to aid um, your, your experience of discipline. Uh, in this life, and um, we can talk about uh, talk about that a little bit more when we get to purgatory. But uh, yeah, what does that like nullify the sufficiency of salvation? The indulgences are an application of Christ's sufficient offering. So, and also, I don't think that temporal discipline is a denial of the all sufficient sacrifice of, of Christ, because you see all throughout Scripture, God disciplines those He loves. Hebrews twelve two. Okay, so whenever you go through various trials and sufferings, you are to take it as discipline from God to make you more righteous, to make you more holy, to make you conform to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So temporal discipline is not contrary to the gospel. It's, it's how a father deals with his son. Um, and whenever we disobey God's commands, even though we might receive forgiveness of those sins in the future, they still harm us. And discipline isn't like punishment. Punishment is um, giving something or giving someone what they're like due, what they're what they're owed, right? So uh, the wages of sin is death. You know, we sin, we merit eternal damnation, right? That's what we earn. That's what we deserve. Uh, whereas discipline has a reformative aspect, right? So you can discipline someone who hasn't even done something wrong to help them grow in holiness. So I, I hope this helps you guys understand that temporal discipline is not a denial of Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice. It's an application of that because by His grace we grow in holiness. It's not by our works. It's not by anything that we can do on our own power. Um, it's, it's by Christ alone that we're able to do this. Yeah. So then why would you want to get out of it? Because it, it's not about getting out of it. Indulgences aren't getting out of it. It's an application of grace. So it's, it's a way to receive um, the grace that is, is supposed to sanctify you, it's supposed to discipline you in that, in that sort of sense. But um, it's not like a get out of jail free card. 
interpret it. Um, it's, it's an application, this application of the uh, uh, atonement of Christ, and we deal with temporal um, consequences for sin in two different ways. We undergo suffering, we undergo trials, temptations, and things like that, but we also perform works of mercy, works of charity, works of love. Um, and so there's two different ways to obtain this sort of discipline for us. You know, you fast, you pray, you read the Bible. Um, nowadays, you can obtain, and you can still obtain indulgences, but you obtain them through reading the scripture for 20 minutes. You know, so it's, it's not just about like being afflicted for your, like the temporal uh, punishment for sin, te temporal consequences for sin. It, it's also performing certain deeds. Uh, so indulgences are, are the application of the merits of Christ. Um, and they, they help you with that. So that, the, to obtain an indulgence, you have to do a, a work of mercy. Right? So it's, it's more than one way to deal with the temporal consequences of sin uh, than just undergoing a certain trial. Good. Uh, okay. Let's see where I'm at. Uh, okay, yeah, the creed. Uh, so, yeah, we went through statistics, history, stuff like that, what the Catholic Church claims for itself. Uh, now we're going to go through essential beliefs. Um, and this is really important um, for interfaith dialogue. Talks about this in um, Vatican II. Um, in, you know, talking about the faith with separated brethren. Uh, separated brethren meaning Protestants, Orthodox, uh, who are fully united to the church visibly. Um, but who are nonetheless a child of God by virtue of your baptism. Um, so it's, it's really important to talk about this concept called the hierarchy of truths. And I doubt any of you have heard of the hierarchy of truths before. So the hierarchy of truths, yeah, it's on this other page. That's why I was confused. Is this like an order of dogma? Uh, it, it, it sort of is. Uh, it, so it's the idea that there, let me actually just, I don't want to screw up because it's very specific. I'm going to just mm -hmm. read this and then let me know if you have questions. Uh, it's the hierarchy of truths is the principle uh, that orders the various doctrines in the relation to fundamental Christian beliefs. Okay, so there's certain beliefs that are absolutely fundamental to the Christian faith that other doctrines might depend upon or that you might have to assume for you to be able to talk about other doctrines. So. I'm not going to go and debate someone about the uh, bodily assumption of Mary if they're an atheist, because we don't even agree on the fundamental truths of the faith, such as monotheism. You know, so there is certain fundamental principles that we have to accept before we accept other doctrines and dogmas. Um, and I, this this is also to help um, kind of get over the stumbling block that many people see when when they come to the Marian dogmas, when they come to things that. You know, why do you require people to believe that under the pain of mortal sin? You know, like why? Why if you reject this and if you're a part of the Catholic Church, then you're you're not right standing with the Church? Well, there's there's they depend on prior doctrine, so it's not like when something is dogmatized, they're just absolutely central and fundamental to the basis of Christianity and all, all its beliefs, but they're related to those things. Um, so denying, let's say, the the perpetual virginity of Mary wouldn't be the same as denying the divinity of Christ. Obviously, there's a disparity there. Obviously, there's something uh, inherently different between those two dogmas, even though they're both dogmas um, of the faith. So some truths are based on other truths, are um, Im implied by other truths, um, or just require other truths to be believed before you can even come to the discussion. Um, so uh, before establishing some doctrines, it's of necessity that doctrines that illuminate and provide a context for them be centralized. Uh, and so, for example, I guess I already gave an example, but before teaching about the resurrection of the dead, you have to believe that there's a God who judges the, the living and the dead, right? Uh, there, it wouldn't make sense to talk about the resurrection of the dead if you didn't talk about the judgment that, or that, that God is a just God and that he desires to set all things right. And uh, there's certain people throughout history who committed atro atrocities without repentance and all these things. And, uh, what would a good, just, holy God allow them to just uh, die peacefully, you know, at, at a ripe old age? You know, uh, it, it makes more sense to establish that there is a, an existence of a just God, a holy God, than it would be to um, 
you know, talk, talk about the, the resurrection of the dead beforehand. Um, another example is um, before teaching about the essential attributes of the, of the church, you teach about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Like the, there's, there's something that's inherent to these doctrines that, that are more fundamental, more central than other doctrines, even though they're essential um, in, in, in the sense that we should believe them. So thus, the events of church history illustrate this as well. Um, but before making a full judgment uh, on later dogmas, um, you know, throughout history, there are that you become more and more defined, more and more solidified regarding other doctrines. Um, the reason for that is the is the um, hierarchy of truths, uh, the central mysteries of the faith. In the first couple hundred centuries of the church, must be adequately defended and established um, and solidified since they provide the foundation for other beliefs. So, beginning in the apostolic age. Uh, the, the spirit of the Antichrist began to attack the central doctrines of the faith, like the incarnation, right? So you see John, the Apostle John, talking about how Christ came in the flesh. We, we saw him, we touched him. Uh, he, he, he spoke to us, he was present with us, and he was physically here. He was fighting against Gnosticism, uh, the, the belief that Christ didn't come with the physical body, right? Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of Christological heresies that arose in the first centuries because that is the fundamental doctrine of, of Christianity. It, Christ is the fullness of truth. He is the fullness of God's revelation. The fullness of deity dwelled in him bodily. You know, so uh, he is, you know, we, when we talk about the word of God, he is the fullest revelation of God in his word. Um, so apostolic age until 325, uh, local councils called synods, uh, you know, they were correcting heresies, docetism we talked about, uh, Sabellianism, denied the multiplicity of persons. So they believed that Father, Son, and Spirit were just one person. It's basically modalism. Um, and chief among these in the first centuries is Arianism, and that's where we get uh, the, the Nicene Creed or the, the Nicene Council, uh, So, which was uh, in 325 AD. Uh, so Constantine the Great convened the, the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea uh, to deal with this heresy, to deal with this controversy, because it was splitting up the empire. You know, you have... You have a lot of um, tension because of this doctrine being espoused, and they hadn't settled it. Uh, there were a few synods, but then synods in Alexandria, but then Arius ran off to a different place. You know, so uh, th there was there was a need to settle it universally uh, by by all bishops together, and that's uh, what an ecumenical council is. Uh, it's a meeting of all the bishops together. So uh, the the Nicene Creed condemned Arianism. But it also began the formulation of the Nicene Creed, or the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. And it's the creed that Catholics, Orthodox, uh, many liturgical Christians quote uh, on, on Sunday. So that's, that's the next portion that we're going to go into, is the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed. Okay, so it's recited every single Mass, uh, unless there's some other creed, like the Athanasian Creed, um, or the Apostles' Creed, or like some sort of baptismal vow on Easter. Uh, in any other case, it's it's recited in every Mass throughout the entire world, um, and it's to remind us of the foundation, the, the centrality of these doctrines to our faith. Um, so I was going to recite this, but I feel like we're going long, so we're just going to hone in on a, on a couple of these because I'm sure you've heard it before. So. The, the very beginning, we talk about the central mystery of the faith that is revealed to us, and that's the being of God himself. Okay? So the central mystery of the Christian faith and life is the revelation of God's nature being the Trinity, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and, and it's the most fundamental, essential teaching of the Christian faith. That's why we don't uh, accept Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons as Christians because they deny the Trinity and they didn't have a valid baptism because baptism is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's also where we get um, the, this, the central mystery of the Christian, the Christian faith is where we get um, one of the oldest prayers in the Christian tradition, and it's the sign of the cross. It reminds us of the Trinity, obviously, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It also reminds us of the uh, incarnation of Christ. Uh, so when you, tra traditionally speaking, whenever you made the sign of the cross, you would hold your hands like this, and the, the three fingers up here re represent the three persons of the divine trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these two fingers down here represent the two natures of Christ. Okay, so human, divine. And it's, it's touching the palm of your hand to remind you that Christ truly, 
physically became incarnate um, and, and dwelt among us. Uh, so central mystery of the Christian faith, Trinity, very important, very central to the Nicene Creed. Uh, and then the, the central event of human history, which is the life, death, burial, and resurrection, and the incarnation of Christ. Um, so by his superabundant merit, um, on, on, in his passion, in his death on the cross and the resurrection, uh, we're granted forgiveness, we're granted justification, we're, we're granted entrance into the divine family of God through adoption, through new birth. Uh, and that, that's the central event that's talked about in the Nicene Creed. Also, uh, the, the church which Christ established is, is also central to, uh, the, to the, the creed, but notice how it comes towards almost the very end. Um, you, you have to establish who God is, the, the persons of the Trinity. You have to establish all these different doctrines before you get to the church. Um, so the, the church is one holy Catholic apostolic. We already talked about Catholic, uh, so I, I might shorten that a little bit, but one refers to the visible unity within the Catholic Church. It makes no sense to talk about uh, this sort of invisible unity that isn't actualized, that isn't uh, able to be perceived. Um, it, the, the oneness, the, the visible unity of the Catholic Church is what this is talking about. We are uh, a singular church disper dispersed throughout the entire world, united to the Bishop of Rome, uh, holding on to a common faith, and manifested locally under the authority of the local bishops, right? So uh, this is why local congregations aren't typically seen as autonomous churches, right? We, we, we affirm a hierarchy and an organizational structure above the local congregation. So um, that's why we refer to these local congregations as parishes um, more so than churches. Now, I, I call them St. Benedict's, St. Benedict's Church sometimes, um, but that's to refer to the, the Catholic Church, the one church rather than distinguishing it from uh, another parish, uh, like St. Gregory's, right? So it's not like these are two separate churches. There's an organizational structure that unites them under the bishop of Rome. Um, so holy refers to the fact that we have been washed and sanctified by the power of God. Uh, it, it refers to the, the Holy Spirit through the labor of regeneration, which is baptism, um, ma making us, sanctifying us, uh, justifying us in, in this rite. Uh, and it talks about this in, in Titus, and we're going to get to this a little bit later, but uh, sanctification is, is chiefly the, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul says that you were sanctified, you were justified, you were, um, you were engrafted into this church, and that's, um, that's the gift of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments. Uh, so Catholic, we mentioned earlier, universality of the church. Apostolic, we also mentioned earlier, apostolic succession. Uh, it refers to the continuity in both uh, ordination and uh, the, the teaching of the faith. So um, you're not going to have teachings being dogmatized that aren't of, the, of apostolic origin or divine origin. Everything that is uh, taught and, and, and uh, everything that is presented to be taught to the faithful um, comes from the deposit of faith that was delivered once and for all to the saints by God uh, in Christ to the apostles. So you have no new revelation. Um, that's, you know, if someone asks me, you know, you accept sacred tradition uh, and not from scripture alone, what's one sacred tradition uh, that you accept that is um, not found in, in scripture? Uh, one, one of those things would be, at least not explicitly, but I would argue not even implicitly, that divine revelation ceased at the death of the last apostle, right? So the, the deposit of faith was delivered once and for all to the saints, uh, through, through Christ's chosen um, leaders of the church, the apostles. And uh, there's not going to be any new public revelation to be offered to the faithful uh, for belief because it was once and for all given. Yeah, uh, the, the deposit is, it's, St. Irenaeus talks about it as the, the deposit that was deposited into a bank and that the church draws uh, teachings out of. Uh, so you can't like just get something out of thin air. You can't have an apparition and just like randomly say, oh, well, I know the apostles didn't teach this or believe this, but uh, we're just going to teach this now. Yes, that's not how it works. And so that really seems to go against the, I'm going to assume, misconception that the Bible isn't, like scripture isn't the only source of revelation. Right, so in Catholicism, and we will talk about this, uh, but I might as well just mention it now. Catholicism does not draw um, her certainty uh, her, um, her, her teachings from the scriptures alone. Uh, the scriptures are, are highly venerated. The scriptures are very important. They're, they're the very words of, 
the Holy Spirit and the exact words that he decided to reveal uh, this, the, the deposit uh, through. But uh, scripture also talks about uh, just the teachings of the apostles in general holding on to them as, as foundational for doctrine. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15 talk about uh, hold on to the traditions in whatever form they were given to you, whether oral or written. Right? So it's, we're commanded to hold on to the teachings of the apostles in general uh, as, as revealed by God, as, as God's word. Um, but obviously the scriptures are seen uniquely as the word of God because the very uh, substance, the way that they are articulated, are inspired by God. Uh, so sacred tradition is the preservation of God's word in a mutable form, um, and the, the scriptures are an immutable way of transmitting the, God's revelation, if that makes sense. Um, so, and, and that's not to say that tradition can change. Uh, when I say the, the way in which tradition is transmitted, I'm saying that the articulation is, is mutable, but the substance of the teaching of, of the tra tradition is immutable. So you can't change God's word. There's a lot of verses, especially Deuteronomy, don't, you can't change what God has revealed, right? Uh, that, there's a lot of penalties attached to that. Uh, and you look at uh, Revelation, um, and those are most likely referring to those particular books that God um, revealed to, to Moses or to St. John. Uh, but the, it, the, the point still stands, you can't alter God's word. That's not, that's not how it works. Um, so, yes. So I think that's pretty much it for like the fundamental beliefs of Catholicism, primarily seen in the Nicene Creed. Am I going wrong? It is. I just said it. Okay. Well, we're okay. We're doing. We're almost done. <laughs> Departure from Baptist theology. Okay. I thought this would be good. Uh, most of you guys understand Baptist theology. You come from a Baptist background, at least. I mean, low church Protestant background. So I, I decided to split up the next couple sections into. The theology which, which Catholics hold, which are held by other Christians, and uh, but which Baptists reject, but also the theology uh, which Catholics hold that distinguish them from Protestants. So I'm going to try and go as, really, as fast as possible in this. Yeah. Baptism, uh, that's that's obviously that's one of the most like fundamental things that that we disagree with Baptists about is that baptism not only regenerates. Uh, but also is not by immersion only, and it can be administered to infants. Baptists would typically disagree with that. Um, Three-tier model Episcopal church governance. This basically means that there's a bishop, priest, and deacon that make up a, a church, and that there's an organizational structure above the local congregation uh, that unifies you um, in, in the faith and in the, in the one church. Um, and the model Episcopal means one bishop, so there's one bishop per area, uh, per diocese. Um, and uh, so rejection of perseverance of the saints. There's a lot of different ways that perseverance of the saints is articulated in the Catholic, or in, in, in the Protestant uh, perspective. You know, you have lordship, you have free grace, you have just uh, automatic perseverance. Uh, Catholics reject the idea that you cannot fall away from the faith if you've been regenerated. Um, and we, see, we get that from St. Augustine. Uh, and, and obviously the teachings of sacred scripture and people beforehand, but you can truly apostatize after becoming a Christian, after being regenerated, after tasting of the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, you can truly apostatize and lose your salvation, lose your justification. You can uh, at, at one time appear just before God, but then after committing a mortal sin unrepentantly um, and, and, and uh, rejecting God, you can fall out of his friendship. Um, so, what? And you come back. Can I come back? Like, no, like, can, once you've rejected your salvation or lost it, yeah. can you be saved again? Yeah, so not um, not out of human uh, effort. Obviously, we we can't come to God on our own. Right. It's empowered right. by grace. Um, and it, that's that's chiefly seen in the sacrament of penance that we're going to talk about in the Protestant, uh, or the things that distinguish Catholicism, Catholicism from Protestantism. Um, but you receive uh, full communion and justification again. Uh, by God offering it to you through the sacrament of penance, right? Um, so it's it's something that you need to uh, respond to God to, and it's not something that you can just be like, all right, I, I committed a mortal sin, but I'm just going to go back, and I don't need God's help. Like that's you know, that's a character caricature that I, that I hear a lot. So I just want to um, clarify that. Uh, so yeah, you can come back, but only by grace, only if you repent from your sins. Um, Worship is liturgical. I mean, you're an Anglican, so you understand, like, liturgy isn't just confined to the Catholic tradition. 
uh, confessional Lutherans, Anglicans, uh, Orthodox, and many other people uh, have a liturgical structure for their um, church government or for their um, church gathering. Um, liturgy basically involves a um, it, it basically involves thank you very much a, a calendar uh, for the celebration of feast days, holidays, daily reading. So we have a three year liturgical cycle. Uh, we're in year A right now, and that just refers to the readings which are present every single day in Mass. We have a reading from the Old Testament, from the, from the Epistles, and from the Gospels, and that's to ensure that you get through the entire Bible in three years. So uh, there's, there's a lot of other things in the liturgy that, is, that distinguishes, it, distinguishes it from the Baptist faith, um, especially the Eucharist. You receive the Eucharist every single Sunday, or every time you, that you go to Mass, so you could go to daily Mass right now and receive the Eucharist. Uh, because it's the central act of worship. That's what we gather together to do uh, for the breaking of bread. Um, icons and statues, you know, I, I see, you know, you go to a Baptist church, you can sometimes see like stained glass depicting certain events, and you'll have some Baptists who are uh, not as adamant on rejecting icons, but most Baptists are informed by the Reformed uh, tradition. So Calvin was like heavily against icons, heavily against statues. Uh, images of any kind, and they see in that um, what what Protestants um, call the second commandment, but it's actually the first commandment. FYI, uh, the the first commandment talks about not bowing to any other gods. Uh, it talks about not uh, making a graven image and uh, worshiping it. Uh, Protestants see in that uh, that we aren't to make any graven images. I mean, like icons, statues, anything like that, for the use of the Christian worship or for that sort of thing for venerating them. Um, but other Protestants accept that. Uh, real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, typically, typically Baptists don't accept this. You have Gavin Alton, who does. You have Dr. Emerson, who does. Um, but it's a sort of spiritual presence. It's not uh, Christ substantially present. It's not Christ locally present. It's Christ in a, um, in a spiritual sense, you are consuming Christ. Um, so, but... Generally, you won't have Baptists accept the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Yeah. Three of the four main branches of Baptist thought will disagree with that statement generally. Which is, well, now I'm, I'm talking about presently in this current day, like yeah. the majority of Bible Belt Baptists will well, reject, like American Baptists will so, reject this. Yes. And most well, Baptists are in America. Southern so Baptists that's Baptist, yeah. would most likely fall this way. Thank you. Right. You have general, northern, and uh, particular. Right. Which all would say that there is real presence in the Eucharist. Right. It's a spiritual presence. Right. So, which is a smaller group. Actually, they think of, of the Baptist. majority, uh, like worldwide, but in the U.S., they are a smaller group. Right. Okay. So there's there, there's that nuance. So I'm, I'm speaking from a position of being, I grew up Baptist, so that's why I say that. Uh, typically, typically, low church, yeah, Protestants, American Protestants, reject real presence. Uh, intercession of the saints, as far as I know, I mean, I may be wrong. Baptists don't ask the saints in heaven to pray for us. Uh, you know, even even um, super like confessional traditional Baptists who like hold to like classical Protestant confessions will say like, no, nah, that's not that's not it. Um, some confessional Lutherans do, uh, Orthodox do, obviously. So that's just Baptist Catholic stuff. Marian doctrines. Um, you freaking Anglican. Uh, Marian doctrines. I think some Anglicans do. Right? Yeah, I think I would only hold to one as actually dogmatic, but Mother of God. Oh, the Marian do uh, yeah. the Marian Oh, intercession. I thought you were talking about intercession. Oh, okay, intercession. Okay, intercession. We go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. Yeah, the Anglicans had a, a, in the first generation accepted transubstantiation as well, which mm -hmm. is interesting. But yeah. Marian dogmas, you accept Mary is the Mother of God truly because yeah. you don't want to be an historian. Cool. Baptists will say that too. You know. I, I'm, I put Marian doctrines on here because like, I'm referring to perpetual virginity, mm -hmm. referring to the assumption of Mary, body, soul, uh, mm -hmm. body and soul into heaven. I'm talking about the coronation of Mary. I'm talking about immaculate conception and sinlessness of Mary. Um, but those things I hold, we hold in common with the Orthodox. Uh, now, the Orthodox will dispute the idea about the immaculate conception because they'll have uh, different ways of interpreting that. Uh, but the Orthodox affirm that Mary was sinless. Uh, they affirm the assumption of Mary to heaven. That's it's in their liturgy. The dormition of Mary after Mary had died and been in the grave for three days. On the third day, she ascended in heaven, or 
uh, didn't ascend. She, is, she was assumed by Christ into heaven. Um, so the Orthodox celebrate these things in their liturgical calendar. I wish one of the Orthodox girls were here so they could confirm that. But Catholics are unique in that belief. Um, so, yeah, even though those, like, people like to say, look, the Marian dogmas were only dogmatized within, you know, the last, whenever it was, like, the 19th century. Um, but it, that's, that's not to say that they were never believed. So I, I can always point to the Trinity as well. Like people believed in the Trinity in the Apostolic Age, right? But it wasn't dogmatized until hundreds of years later. So just because something is, isn't dogmatized yet doesn't mean it's not present in the liturgy, doesn't mean it's not universally taught in the ordinary magisterium. Uh, so yeah, anyways, cool. We good? Can we go on? Okay. Catholic distinctives. This is where we're going to get more depart departure because it's just like, like no Protestant would agree with this kind of stuff. Papacy, I mean, you guys could probably guess the papacy is the, the distinguishing doctrine of Catholicism. So um, the, the Pope is the successor, successor of St. Peter to the See of Rome. Uh, the leader of the apostles, St. Peter was, so the, the, the Pope is the leader, the, the bishops, and the universal church um, now. The Pope is the visible head and source of unity for the entire church. Uh, you see this attested to in St. Irenaeus, 2nd century. You see this attested to in St. Cyprian, uh, again, 2nd century. Um, so very, very early on, you see, at, at the very least, the, the, the Bishop of Rome is seen as the principal source of unity. Uh, you see St. Leo the Great and the formula of Pope Hormisdas uh, in the Ecumenical Council of uh, freaking... Council? It wasn't council. It was one of the ecumenical councils. But the formula for Mizdas is, is a way of determining whether someone belongs to the communion of the Catholic Church, the universal church. And it's if they're united to the Bishop of Rome, both Western and Eastern churches accepted this. This was 5th century, right? So you, you see this, the, the papacy being explained over and over and over again throughout the first millennia of the church. Um, the, the Pope has universal and immediate jurisdiction. They, they don't like, they can't only uh, ex excommunicate people within the jurisdiction of Rome. They have immediate and universal jurisdiction so that they could excommunicate someone who is outside of the Diocese of Rome. And you see the Bishop of Rome throughout history, again, with the case of St. Cyprian, he condemns people who commit heresy, who are outside of his diocese, and he also restores people to their office who are not in his diocese. Uh, so you see this being exercised uh, throughout history, uh, and no other bishop claims these powers, uh, and, and no, no, no bishop tries to exercise these same things, um, and just preeminent authority because of that. So I'm sure there's objections, but does anyone have any questions? No? Okay, good stuff. Any objections? You're wrong! <laughs> Uh, I'm just not sold on Vatican I. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, there's a lot of Catholics that aren't, but, you know, it's an ecumenical council, so. Seven sacraments. The whole church is a present is ecumenical. What do you say? The whole church is a present is ecumenical. The old church is it? The whole church is a present is ecumenical. It's only ecumenical if it's ratified by the Bishop of Rome. So, like I was talking about earlier, if it was ratified by the Bishop of Rome, he doesn't have to be present, obviously, in the first couple ecumenical councils. He sent legates to, um, preside and stuff like that, um, and, and to inform the discussions, but it is only when a council that has bishops, like a lot of bishops present, is ratified and confirmed by the Pope after the council and, and, and the um, the canons are ratified that it is considered ecumenical. So I brought up the um, example of a council uh, that included more bishops in it than uh, some of the ecumenical councils did. But it was never considered an ecumenical council because the Bishop of Rome was not only not present, didn't have papal legates there, but didn't even confirm it later on. Okay, so it, that that that's one example as to, as to why uh, ecumenical councils need the ratification of the Bishop of Rome, historically speaking, um, and you know why they're even able to gather for ecumenical councils in, in general. You know, so uh, they could have gathered for just a local synod and they condemned people and have canons and stuff, but the, the Church of the West and the East didn't accept that as ecumenical, and they never have. Um, so, 
and now they're in Protestants, um, to, at least to my knowledge. I don't, I don't recall any classical Protestant making the case that this specific council was ecumenical, um, because it just it, it wasn't considered that. Um, so, yeah, the, the Bishop of Rome doesn't have to be like locally present in the in the council, but there has to be a uh, representative or a legate that uh, the Pope sends, and um, you know the 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 Pope's signature is always at the very beginning of everyone who signs on this ecumenical council, on, on, on the canons and stuff. Uh, even if uh, the, the Pope wasn't present uh, locally, but he sent legates, you see the papal legates always sign first. Um, and that, that's just another example of why, of, of how integral the, the, the papacy is to the formulation of canons, uh, to the to formulation of ecumenical creeds and stuff. Questions before we move on? Second, sac or seven sacraments. Good stuff. Okay. So I know that um, there are a lot of these that Protestants will affirm in a certain sense, but no Protestant will say that there's seven sacraments. That was one of the distinguishing things that uh, Luther and Calvin um, dissented from uh, initially, is that they didn't see, um, but because they held to the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, uh, they, they weren't convinced of five of these seven sacraments, so they typically only see baptism and Eucharist as sacraments. Even though these other things can be practiced for spiritual benefit, um, they're not, uh, like, they don't impart sanctifying grace. Uh, but, you know, Lutherans will accept the same exact doctrine of baptism as Catholics do. I mean, Luther, Luther even said in his, confessional, in, in his confessional documents, but also in his responses to the uh, Catholic magisterium at the time, that they didn't have baptism wrong. Like everything they say about baptism, we're good, we're good on that. Uh, it justifies you, it gives you sanctifying grace and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's the content of the sacraments, it's how they work out in the sacramental eco uh, economy, um, and just that they were considered to be sacraments in general. So sacraments are uh, are rites established by Christ to confer grace, sanctifying grace, to the church. So there's some uh, sacraments that can only be performed once. There's some sacraments that are expected to be expected to be performed on a weekly basis, um, but all of them are to aid in the Christian life. Um, and I don't think I have individual. Yeah, I don't have individuals for those. So I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything on the sacraments before we move on. Um, so baptism, and I, I've already talked about baptism, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, baptism regenerates, baptism justifies you, it, it wraps you to Christ, it includes you in the church, um, things like that. It, it imparts the grace of justification. Confirmation increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so you see it uh, in, in the book of Acts, whenever people have been baptized, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit. So it's through the, through the laying on of hands that the apostles confer the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in uh, the book of Acts on multiple occasions. You see the Eucharist, uh, we believe in transubstantiation. It's the idea that the, uh, although the accidents, the, the appearances of bread and wine remain uh, after the words of confirmation, the substance, the what it is-ness of uh, these elements become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Um, that was established uh, and dogmatized uh, at the Fourth Lateran Council. It's something that uh, Martin Luther and all the Protestant reformers rejected for a um, different view. You know, Luther had a form of consubstantiation. You have uh, some people holding the spiritual presence, like uh, John Calvin and the Reformed folk. Um, but uh, also, an implication of the Eucharist is that you can, since Christ is locally present, you can come to uh, the Eucharist and, and truly say, that is my God, that is my Lord. Um, and you can come to the host that is preserved after its consecration uh, and, and, and perform a, for, a form of worship, adoration um, to Christ who is present in the Eucharist. Um, so, I mean, I, I definitely consider uh, John 6 very important to the discussion of real presence. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you affirm real presence, you know what I'm talking about. If anyone eats my flesh and drinks my blood, uh, will have eternal life. Whoever doesn't eat my flesh and drink my blood won't have eternal life. Because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And he just goes over and over and over and over, and over again. Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. Cool beans. All right, so confession. 
sometimes called the sacrament of penance, sometimes called the sacraments of, sacrament of reconciliation. After you commit a mortal sin, the, the theological virtues, uh, God's charity, God's justification that he's poured into you, that he's infused into you, is destroyed. Okay? So it's, it's a way of receiving God's grace, being brought back into communion with his church and him. And, um, yeah, so they, they absolve you of your sins. I'm making my first confession tomorrow night. It's going to be pretty sick. And, uh, yeah, you confess your mortal sins. You're forgiven of your mortal sins. Um, and, you know, you can look to John chapter 20, verses 21 through 24 or 23 or something like that. Well, when Jesus Christ gives, it institutes this uh, sacrament with the apostles, he breathes on them, says, Re receive the Holy Spirit. Whose ever sins you forgive, they are forgiven, and whose ever sins you retain, they are retained. He gives the ability to forgive sins sacramentally to the apostles so that they um, can perform this sacrament. Um, so, again, it's going to be disputed by Protestants who don't accept uh, the sacrament of reconciliation. Any questions so far before I blaze through the rest of this? Because I know we're going late. Good stuff. All right. Uh, anointing of the sick. If you're sick, James 5. If you're sick, have the elders anoint you with oil and you will be healed. You're, you're, you're uniting your suffering to the suffering of Christ. He gives you the graces to deal with that, uh, whatever you're going through. So if you're sick, if, you're, if you have uh, this, this uh, hunch that you're going to die, you can receive this sacrament. Um, and it also talks about how they receive forgiveness through the laying out of hands and anointing of oil. Read James 5 after you're done with this if you don't believe me. Because if he's committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. Uh, so, all right. Holy orders, that just basically means uh, you're, you're consecrated, you're given the graces to perform uh, in the person of Christ the sacraments for the benefit of the church. You lead the liturgy, you're a priest, deacon, and bishop. Those are the three orders that you can be ordained to. Um, and only consecrated men, only people who have received this sacrament um, can... Uh, consecrate the host. So if you're, I guess if you're a deacon, you can't consecrate the host either. You have to receive the sacrament of holy orders as a priest or a bishop. Matrimony, not just marriage, sacrament, good stuff, gives you grace. It reflects the uh, relationship of Christ to the church. Uh, it empowers you to, uh, to engage in this relationship as opposed to bring others into the mystery of the faith. Uh, and help you not screw your children up. Uh, also, cool beans. Any questions? All right, we're speeding through. Revelation, we reject Sola Scriptura. We reject Sola Scriptura. Um, yeah, I... Sola Scriptura is not taught implicitly or explicitly by, this, by the Scriptures. Uh, the Church hasn't held to Sola Scriptura throughout the ages, uh, and so we reject that. Uh, it's, yeah, we, we've... We look to tradition as well as um, preserving the Word of God, so we're able to draw our uh, certainty about doctrine not from the Scriptures alone, but also from sacred tradition and the magisterium expl explains the div divine deposit that is present in the uh, sacred Scriptures and sacred tradition. Um, yeah, justification. This is the final one that we're going to go through because I know we're going late. Um, there is a difference but it's just, I think it's a word game. And I know there's like a, there's like a fundamental difference, and I'll get to that, um, which is, is justice infused to you or is it imputed to you? Okay, so the doctrine of double imputation is the idea that your sins are imputed to the account of Christ, and, and so Christ is punished for your sins on the cross. And Christ's righteousness that he obtained, that he merited by his life, is imputed to your account, so, Christ, so God looks at you when he's judging you, and sees you as righteous, not because of your, the righteousness that is in you, but because of the righteousness that is imputed to your legal account. So you're not righteous. Uh, you just appear to be righteous because of Jesus. Uh, the, the Catholic view is that, yes, salvation, righteousness, justification is a gift from God. It's, it's obtained by grace through faith, um, all, all those things. But righteousness isn't a legal fiction, and I don't want to, I don't want to caricature it, so... Don't, don't quote me on that. I'm saying that righteousness, when God declares us righteous, he's not saying that even though you, know, you are going to remain inwardly unrighteous, I'm just going to look at my son instead of you. It's the idea that God 
infuses the theological virtues into us, faith, hope, and charity, infuses righteousness as a gift into us so that we actually become righteous. Okay? Um, so Protestants will see this uh, and think of the process of sanctification. And those two things are, are intricately linked in Catholicism. So there's an initial act that God declares you to be righteous. He makes you righteous by His grace uh, through faith. Uh, but then you can grow in holiness. You can grow in righteousness. That's the process. That's the already not yet. So you're already saved, but you're also being saved. Uh, and that's what Catholics mean by growth and justification. They don't mean, oh, you have to make up for God's failure. God didn't do enough for you. you you gotta, you got to make up for it. It's You have to foster this gift that God has put inside of you. And, and grow in this gift as if you're drawing more on the graces of God. It's like a seed that's implanted in you that's growing more and more and more. Um, so that's what justification is in Catholic theology. It's not just an initial event. It's an initial event with ongoing um, growth and ongoing um, effects. Uh, and you know, I could go way, way more in depth, but we are at time, so good stuff. Any questions before we head out? So you could say, in a sense, justification is by sola fide, but no. It's so love. Uh, I think. See, I think sola fide is is. You can nuance it enough to where you can say you can affirm sola fide. Mm -hmm. I think it's problematic because mm -hmm. first and foremost, the only time sola fide is mentioned in scripture is in James two twenty four. I'm sure you're aware of it. We are not justified by faith alone, but by works. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have to in our theology uh, affirm affirm that we aren't by faith alone saved, but works play some role in justifying us. Mm -hmm. So what a Catholic will say is yes, but the the initial act of justification is apart from any works, any good works, any any works of the Mosaic Law. It's it's pure grace. It's it's through faith, you receive it in the sacrament of baptism. It's something that God does to you. Um, but the process of justification, where you grow in justification, uh, also known as sanctification, uh, is, is by works. It's not by faith alone. Uh, and you know, James talks about how if you have a faith, if you have faith but you don't have works, your faith is dead, so it's, faith alone isn't sufficient to save you. John 15 talks about if you don't bear any fruit, uh, God the Father will cut you off from the true vine, which is Christ. Um, but by, by abiding in him, you will bear fruit. And the way that you abide in him is by keeping his commandments. Uh, so that's just a, a, a parabolic way of saying you have to foster the gift that God has given you, uh, bear fruit, be obedient to his commands, um, and he's not going to cut you off, but you in hell. So um, I, I think it's problematic to say sola fide um, just because, I mean, that language, that, that sort of language is specifically condemned in scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a way to nuance it enough to say, like, works without faith don't save, but also faith without works. Like, if you don't have any works ever, you're not going to be saved. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's, a new, there's a nuanced way to say it, but I, I would just push back against it and say, mm -hmm. guys, let's just formulate our doctrine some other way. Just just talk about it in some other way than just saying we're saved by faith alone or we're justified by faith alone. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of complications when you say, when you add alone to that. Uh, so it doesn't allow for as, as much nuance. Uh, and also, again, that's condemned by scripture, that specific formulation. Whether that's what James meant or not, that's disputed. But again, just saying it like that, saying it the exact way that James puts it and negates it, is just, that's problematic to me. Uh, so, and that's probably why Martin Luther wanted to take James out of the Bible. So. <laughs> Pistol straw. Yeah, a pistol straw. Let's throw Jimmy in the fire and <laughs> get it over with. Yeah, no, that's James Hebrews Revelation, Deuter Canon. Yeah. So, anyways, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, joining us. We went 25 minutes after, but hey, we started late, so uh, thank you for coming. Thank you guys for listening to me and not making me. You know, it's kind of exciting. Him to bring tomatoes or something. So. I don't know. Okay, good stuff. I could have. But...